Stranger Things. Stranger Things. Stranger Things. Or is it Stranger Things? We as a society need to decide if it's Stranger Things or Stranger Things. You're all saying it differently and it's making me uncomfortable. Are the things stranger or are the things stranger? Stranger Things has a weird shape to it. Like it folds back in on itself like Stranger Things. Stranger Things has a good one-two punch to it. Stranger Things. Stranger Things. It follows a three-act structure. It makes sense. If you're wondering what I've been up to, I found a tunnel in my backyard. I've been digging down there. I found a gold mine down there. I've been excavating the gold so I can give it to you. You can't distribute the means of production without seizing them, and that's a fact. Speaking of seizing, remember when our hearts collectively seized up during that Kate Bush running up that hill scene in Stranger Things Season 4? <laughs> Why are you running? In 2022, Stranger Things released season four of a series that should have been one season. By season three, the nostalgia just wasn't what it used to be. They released this highly bingeable event in two batches. The first seven episodes dropped at once on May 27th, and then they did the two finale episodes simultaneously on July 1st, which I thought was a pretty good idea. Keep the binging tradition intact while also reintroducing us to the idea of waiting for something for four seconds. The first batch of episodes culminated in a life or death confrontation between beloved character Max and this goo man. I think his name is... <laughs> Real quick to sum it up, if you ain't seen it, there was a spooky monster that infects you with emo syndrome and gives you hallucinations that are scary and then appears to you in your dream and kills you and if you die in the game, you die in real life. Very standard Stranger Things thing. So this is happening with someone we actually give a shit. Oh no, but her friends play her favorite song, which reminds her about that she's in a hallucination. And then she uses the power of friendship to remember that um depression is, you can escape depression if you punch it and run. <laughs> And everyone cried. <laughs> so why did people cry? Well, people feel uh, attached to the character of Max and may genuinely be afraid that she's going to die here in a very practical sense. The nostalgic montage of her having friends with her friendos is tear jerking in a context where we might lose it all. Then when she rediscovers her will to live and finds some hidden reservoir of strength within her soul and desperately claws back towards life against all odds away from this demon man and goo man, <laughs> demon, demon goo man. There's something universal about that emotion and this struggle and this triumph of the human spirit with this Kate Bush song serving as some luminous aesthetic detail elevating this well-executed scene of attention. Okay, that's fine, but I don't think that's it. The thing is, when I watched this scene for the first time, I hadn't seen season four of Stranger Things, but it did make me cry anyways. I thought we lost you. I'm still here. I'm still here. And since I've watched Stranger Things Season 4 and experienced this in context, I haven't gone back to watch the rest of Stranger Things Season 4, but I've gone back to watch this scene like a hundred times. I, like many others, have cried and yearned and tried to articulate what's so profound about it because it's hard to articulate what's so profound about it. Lucky for you, I'm very articulate. These are the three layers of depth at which we're going to give testament to the meaning of this scene. The metatextual, metaphorical, and metaphysical. I counted those on my metacarpals. It's supposed to be funny. Jokes. Layer one, the metatextual. Believe it or not, the metatextual one is the surface level. It goes like this. Oh, that's that girl from Stranger Things. I like her. Oh no, she's gonna die. Oh, I don't want her to die. Oh, I thought she was good. Oh no, this looks really bad. I think they might kill her. Oh, she's remembering all those times that she was alive. I like those times. I remember those times. Oh, maybe it would make me so sad if she died because of those times. Oh. Oh, oh, she's getting away. Oh, run, bitch. Yes. Yes. Oh, I was so scared she was going to die for a second. What a journey. That is the straight ahead physical interpretation of the events we are looking at. The simulation of tension and release. That thing that film can do for us with the Kuleshov effect. So on the simple, fundamental, ooh, I hope she doesn't die, yay, she didn't die, level, this works as an action scene with stakes. Since I am an optimizer obsessed with perfection, I can pick at the bit where she rips a little bit of meat out of his meat neck and this counts as like a physical blow against him without explanation. Like, bro, if you can think happy thoughts to unravel tentacles and you can physically rip little meat tubes out of his neck, this is very important game-changing datum of magic system knowledge. That's his weakness, the tubes. All right, boys, we got this. Just everyone hold hands and close your eyes, think happy thoughts and walk towards the goo man and think in happy thoughts so the tentacles can't get you because of the good vibes. And then when you're close enough, just grab and pull. Also, while she's running away, he just like stands menacingly and throws buildings vaguely at her. It's like he's not trying to hit her. He's just trying to get her dirtied with mud. Oh no, you got mud on me. Don't get mud on me. <laughs> like when those spikes go like, it's just like, oh my God, you attacked the ground near me. Ah! He has telekinesis. 
Can you not telekinetically just pick her up and bring her back and then murder her? Or pick her up and snap her neck at a distance? You start to wonder what the physical things that happen in the internal psychological world represent. So whatever, you can kind of microanalyze and perfect things forever. I think that might be the point too, if perfection is always out of grasp, then it functions as this kind of north star that constantly guides you progressively towards higher and higher quality. Perfection is a process, not a destination. That's fine. But without trying to change the scene or imagine what else the scene could be and just looking at what the scene is, this feels momentous and it feels tense. It allows a slippery, soft, magic-y thing to entrap you with this point-blank tension of someone you like maybe dying in this life that you know may be ending, but they escape from the maw of annihilation by the skin of their teethies. Joseph Campbell was a man. He's famous for the hero's journey which is a thing. He is often invoked to explain the goodness of a piece of art because it resembles some sort of universal journey. And, and you know, and I have publicly positively propagated Joseph Campbell online and there is also ample Campbell criticism online. And that's fine, he's a guy. He comes with his baggage. And Joseph Campbell is just a guy. He's just a guy. I feel like there's two main concerns. The one thing is anytime you assert an objective system of value, like this is how things are and this is what's important, this is what meaning is and I figured it out. Anytime you do that, you are inherently to some degree suffocating alternative forms of value. You're, you're asserting your opinion potentially at the expense of others or forcing other people's ideas to kind of conform to your meta idea. When you do big philosophy, it's not like you've ascended out of humanity into godhood and you're now like objectively seeing the world. There's this pseudoscience myth that when you're objective, you just disappear from the face of the earth and see everything undistorted as it really is, like God from heaven. But that's rubbish. A lot of the time, the people that assert objective, rational truth and value coincidentally are asserting value systems that happen to rank themselves on top. <laughs> this is why we keep our subjectivity button on hand to escape from our objective assertions. But you cannot simply slam the subjectivity button forever or you never get anywhere. If we just sit here and go, it's whatever, man, it's freaking subjective. Everything's freaking subjective, man. It's like, whatever, man. You know, it's just whatever you feel, bro. Nothing's real, bro. It's just like whatever you feel, man. I feel like that's not honoring the reality of value and truth and beauty. You're not sincerely committing to the best you've got to offer. So anyways, all that being said, Campbell's idea that life follows a triadic structure of birth, death, and rebirth it's not just some old white man thought. It's cosmic. Life is a cycle. It's a pattern. It begins and ends and begins again. The rising and setting of the sun tell you that. The changing of the seasons tell you that. The reincarnation of your parents into your children tells you that. And I'm saying all this to honor the simple stupid tension of the action movie. That surface level experience of, oh I like that girl. Hope she don't die. Oh she made it out. The real death was her killing the part of herself that brought her to that death place, allowing her to return to life, revivified with that death experience. So yeah, on the basic level, the scene, it just works. It is a sequence of isolated events that constitute a full experience that makes you go, oh, oh, no, oh, it was worth it. However, this particular iteration of this common arc is supercharged with metatextual sentimentality and a perfect synergy of textual and paratextual purpose. In this scene, Max is in the nightmare hell dimension and the goo man is coming. Max is caught by the Goo Man, and they exchange the following dialogue. They can't help you, Max. You belong here with me. You're not really here. Oh, but I am Max. I am. I will do killing you now. You're not real. This can't be real. It is real. I'm doing killing you. Goodbye. In the moments leading up to her killing and dying and death and such, Max closes her eyes, maybe accepting her death, but instead remembers her life. And this suddenly gives her an epiphanic desire to continue living, to fight against the end with everything. And on the face of it, that is relatable and inspiring. But the thing I think really throws jet fuel onto the candle of this scene with this particular manifestation is the metatextual element. Remember that notion that Stranger Things should have only lasted one season? I think that general cultural feeling is ironically one of sentimentality and nostalgia, and not for the 80s, but but 
for when these kids were literal or kids. <laughs> There's a scene where uh, I think you, ha you have a kiss. It's a kiss. And... I know. <laughs> like, we miss our ability to consume the childhood of these actual human beings that age. <laughs> I feel, as you might, tender about these kids. Oh, what? These are bouncy chairs. They're very yes. bouncy. Yeah, mine don't bounce as much. We can do the whole thing bouncy. All right. Oh my God. Okay. All right, let's settle down, kids. Oh, okay. uh, Part of the appeal is the sweet kids with their wholesome chemistry doing a pretty good thing, regardless of your opinion on the quality per season. 12 Ricks have already opened accounts here. That's a lot of Ricks. Yeah. <laughs> we still tune in because it's Stranger Things and I like these kids and the theme song go wah. For the last six years, the children have danced like little prepubescent monkeys for our entertainment. And you know what? I wish them well. It was good. Remember when Stranger Things dropped? It was good. I was surprised it was good. I was like, whoa. Stranger than what? And then they got older and I was like, damn, they get, they do be getting older though. And do you remember when season two dropped in 2017? The follow-up to that thing that didn't require a follow-up and we're watching the boys' bodies change. <laughs> we're watching the boys grow up and we're seeing more demons and how do we spike the sequel up? How about a woman? Uh, girl time. Sometimes there is a girl. And I felt, as an audience member, how the characters feel when you add a new person to this mix of a thing you like. Party members only. Hey, we have a good thing here. Are you gonna mess it up? Are you gonna make it better? Better, better make it better. They made the metatextual tension of making a second season to this really good thing and adding a new character to the mix and whether or not that makes things better or worse, part of the actual diegetic story. The boys feel unsure about Max and whether or not to let Goral into group. I myself unlocked my sexism when she proposed Zoomer as a Dungeons and Dragons class. Well, I could be your Zoomer. That's not even a real thing. But I, like any responsible sexism owner, keep my sexism locked in a safe and I only take it out when necessary to protect my family. I generally don't assign any credence to gender essentialist interpretations of reality. I think it's like 89% nurture and intersubjective socialization, but what I have noticed lately is maybe a woman trait is when someone takes out their phone and opens up their camera roll and and just shows you pictures of things for like 30 minutes like that counts as an activity just aimlessly scrolling through boring crap in your camera and then showing it <laughs> And this was when, this was, we got this, so it was me and Sandra were out and we got the, it was like strawberry with, it was covered, it was like strawberries covered in chocolate, but it came like after and it was with coffee and it was like small though. And I, anyways, sorry, I have a better picture of it. Really I'm saying it's Goral and old people, but just slightly different tone. Then I went on a walk with Sue, you remember Sue, and we saw this, we saw this tree, there it is, we saw this tree, we love this tree. But you know what, since 2017, I have warmed up to the Zoomer. The Zoomers as a whole, even. I have hope for you. Just delete TikTok, then we can talk, ticks. Sadie Sink is steadily proving herself magnitudes more than a second season stunt addition to a squad. She's snatching roles and making moves and being ginger queen. Obsessed with this jacket, the shoulders and the quad slit. Girly, where do I buy it? We don't watch Stranger Things season four without the awareness that Stranger Things was initially a self-contained single season cohesive arc starring prepubescent kids. We're watching their voices drop in real time and it's affecting our artistic experience. It would be a fundamentally different aesthetic experience if, for example, they switched out the actors every season to keep them young. These paratextual extra artistic elements influence the particularities of our art experience. Therefore, I allege that this flashback montage isn't just a flashback for Max's character. It's a flashback sequence that converses with our mass relationship with Sadie Sink, the human being, and Stranger Things, the cultural phenomenon. The thing about the Max remembering the things montage is it's not just flashbacks that a character is having to happy times that encourage her to go on. It's literal footage from her five years ago in like real time, like Sadie Sink five years ago. <laughs> she looks really young because she is really young. To sentimentally clip show our way through this fictional character's fictional memories and fictional relationships in their fictional world and fictional time is for a moment synchronistic with our literal reflection on our real world relationship with Max the character, Sadie Sink the person, and Stranger Things the show in real time. Over real years, Max from Stranger Things is not my favorite character of all time. This isn't my favorite show of all time, but I remember it and I know it and I watch it and I've grown with it. And I remember when Elle and Max got ice cream 
And I remember when she kissed Caleb. I remember when she roller skated around our previous main character and the tension, whether or not she's a worthy addition to the cast was simultaneously fictional and non-fictional. The practical immediate stakes of this action scene are energized not simply by good character work, but by a seamless unification of fact and fantasy under the banner of relationship. <laughs> So yeah, it's easy to care. Layer two, metaphorical. Okay, okay, but beyond this barbaric concept of caring whether or not someone we know lives or dies, what does it mean? Like, what is it like really? When interpreting art as metaphorical, what you're doing is reenacting some form of the spirit and flesh duality. There's the scene in its explicit meaning, like girl got a goo man there, got, girl get away from the goo man. And then there's the real meaning the deeper meaning. In this case, if you gander down to the comment section of this clip, you'll find some philosophical savants that have deduced that this scene could be interpreted as a metaphor for depression. When you're depressed and you watch this scene, it hits even harder because it's like a metaphor for what's battling your mind. I think why people love this scene so much because it is basically about anyone who is struggling with depression. For someone who has anxiety and depression, this scene really gets to me. It helps me fight my anxiety and depression. This scene is a perfect example of the phrase, music is an escape for so many people. People. Good job! You did an interpret! In this season of Stranger Things, Max is dealing with the complex trauma of her abusive older brother dying in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> He was abusive and a bad person and problematic, and so it's probably maybe even better that he is gone, but that doesn't erase the fact that abuser doesn't actually describe his totality. He was also her brother, he was also a person. So on one hand, you'd be like, well, it's good my abuser's gone, but on the other hand, you're also like, damn, abusers be people though. He was an asshole. So there's less assholery. I imagine that we, that we could have become friends. Yeah, I know that's stupid. You ever notice those people that are really happy to cancel people are the same people that generally advocate for prison abolition? That's fun. I've been fighting my past and fucking dragging its ass. I know I look pretty bad, but you should see the other guy. Trauma. We all have it. And if you don't, don't worry, it's coming. Yeah, this scene's about depression, but what is depression? <laughs> Alone? Time. What is it? It do be passing though. We are all zoomers, zooming through history. Time travel is possible forward one second at a time. I can teleport slowly with my legs. You may be familiar with the idea that dwelling on the past leads to depression and dwelling on the future leads to anxiety. This is maybe a little reductive, but also maybe true and useful. You may also be familiar with the very popular idea that trauma is something that locks you into your past. It's kind of the definition of trauma, something that takes you out of the present and causes you to re-experience the past vividly. I don't normally shout out other YouTube channels on my channel because this is my territory, but uh, Implicitly Pretentious is a YouTube channel that I think is good. It is run by a good boy named Leo. Well, I find like subjectivity is the greatest, is one of the greatest human resources. If, if you just have like a, like a massive infinite data stream of like pure objective facts, here's every single point in account. If you can't interpret it subjectively, it doesn't make any, it's just data. For years, Leo has been religiously churning out videos on topics like Marvel movies, DC movies, comic books, Batman, Batman, and also Batman. But the catch is, he's only ever read one book and has one idea. As I quote from The Mnemonic Imagination by Emily Kitely and Michael Pickering for the fifth fucking time, trauma is when an experience is so contradicting to your sense of continuity that your internal narrative is effectively destroyed. Trauma is when your sense of logic that your entire identity is built on is so deeply contradicted. Trauma by nature restricts the self from imagining the future because it's an event so painful. As Emily Kitely and Michael Pickering said, trauma is when an event is so painful that it inhibits the individual's ability to- Trauma is when you lose authorship of your own life because an event is so painful. That trauma is when an event is so painful and contradictory to your sense of As Emily Keatley and Michael Pickering said from, you know what? Iconic behavior, king behavior, no notes, don't change anything, you're a genius. Don't let anyone tell you to stop digging your cool tunnel. This is what boys will be boys means. The book that he has managed to get this insane amount of mileage out of is called The Mnemonic Imagination by Emily Keatley and Michael Pickering. He has cited and quoted this book so many times on this channel that he can't really do it anymore because it's beyond redundant but even when he is not talking about this book, he is talking about this book. He can do it for the boys, he can do it for Iron Man, he can do it for Superman, he can do it with Iron Man, he can do it with Iron Man, he can do it with Batman, he can do it with Superman, he can do it with the boys, it's the same shit. Again, he's fucking amazing. I love him, I love him. I wanna swaddle him in a rag like baby Jesus. Imagine just living your whole life watching superhero movies and repeatedly throwing one big book at it. It's the ideal existence. I'm doing my career wrong. We're all doing our careers wrong. The thing is though, 
It's a really good book. The central proposition of this book is a response to the idea that we use our memories to look back into our past and our imaginations to look towards the future. Cause that just makes sense, right? You have experiences, you remember them, you store them in your brain. And then if you want to know what's going to happen next, you kind of look at your old memories and go like, well, that's probably something like that's going to happen. It's called induction, bitch. But your brain is not a computer. You're not a cold steel machine that stores data that remains static. You're a weird wet machine. And the way that you deal with things is in stories and meaning. You can never really upload your brain to a computer the way that we like to imagine that we can in like our sci-fi games because your memories aren't just data. They're active ongoing projects that you can recreate and change with your imagination. And that's not a bad thing. The malleable and fluid nature of patterns and narrative is what allows us to process information so magnificently. It's also why eyewitness testimonies is bad sometimes, but it's also why I was so good at everything else. There are, for example, cases where we confuse what we imagine with what we remember, or what we remember with what we imagine. Just as there are others where we are not sure if we have seen someone in the past few weeks, or heard a particular song on the radio, or if we have imagined seeing this person or hearing that song. If you just want to record data, there is endless data in the universe. There are endless hypotheses you could write about anything. The way that we choose what data to give a shit about or to record or what hypothesis to test is because we care about value. We're heat seeking missiles tuned in on value. And you don't need to understand the atomic nature of glass to understand what a wine glass is. And you don't need to have a good idea of different kinds of wine glasses to understand drinking at the bar with your friends. The way our wet brains work allow us to grab that final idea without having to build it up from its constituent elements. You're smarter than that. <laughs> Motherfuckers are always trying to get me to talk about AI art, thirsting to know my opinion on the issue. Fine. I don't think it's real. This shit isn't artificial intelligence. It's tools that human beings made to non-consensually harvest the data of other human beings. And then a group of human beings decides how to use that data in a way that earns them profit. Then they spin these tales about how we're making sentient robots and we're just on the cusp of creating life. No, we're not. We just lived in a fucked up surveillance state and we should probably change that. This mythology about AI just obfuscates the constant need for human input for any of this to do anything. The only reason the AI chatbot can speak back to you is because it's listening to your phone calls. My personal subject aesthetic opinion is I have literally never seen an AI generated piece of art that I actually like. Like, I'm not just looking for, wow, cool image that didn't exist previously. I care about art as a tool for meaning and connection and actual expression. So, so I, I, don't, I don't give a fuck if it just generates something. What people call AI art at its best is just generative art. And we, we know what that is. That's just a human being using a tool that has a randomizing element to it and then deciding how to direct that and how to edit it afterwards. But without the human intervention, it doesn't do anything. The robots aren't making art. We're making art. Our fucking analog synthesizers, AI art, it's so stupid. Stop asking me about it. Stop talking about fake robots and talk about data mining and capitalism. Generative art tools are not going to replace artists. Artists might have to shift their focus like they did when we went from analog to digital in music studios, but it's always gonna be people, okay? It doesn't work without the people. Okay, okay, so our brains are more interesting and complicated than a memory card, and that makes us divine, but also gives us trauma like Max from Stranger Things. <laughs> Segways, I've never needed them. The Goo Man from Stranger Things Season 4 has a method. He murders people by giving them depression and using imagery from their worst experiences and memories to keep them ruminating about their past in a way that makes them unable to imagine a future in relation to that traumatic experience. This is what the mnemonic imagination defines as what trauma is and the guide to healing from trauma. Trauma, according to Keatley and Pickering, is when you have an experience banked in your story that is so incongruous with your previous understanding of yourself that you cease to be able to imagine a future. Typically, you use your memories to construct a continuity that you could call your identity. When I was a kid, I was like this, and then I did this, and I was in those places, and then I learned about this, so I got interested in that, I kept learning about that, and now I do that, and that's kind of who I am. But your memories don't only serve to inform you of who you are, they also inform you of who you are in the future, what you are becoming, what you are going towards. It allows you to imagine tomorrow. I know from my memories that I love art, I love people, I love my friends, I love my mom, I love work, transcendent good work, I like wine. Therefore, I will speak to my friends and I call my mom and I make things and I give them to people and I plan to do more and do better. Who I am is not just the sum of my memories, it's also my teleology, it's my purpose, where I'm going. Memory is mobile and formative, not merely repetitive. It is this which gives memory its creative potential but the potential is only realized through the productive tension that arises between memory and imagination. The creative quality of these interactions has a cross-temporal resonance, with memory necessary in thinking of the future, 
and imagination necessary in thinking of the past. So a traumatic experience, by this definition, is an experience that interrupts your sense of identity. It doesn't match with your idea of yourself. It doesn't make sense in the story you tell yourself about yourself. The experience feels like it shouldn't be there. I don't identify with this. This ruins everything. Who am I now? Anyone else got trauma? Now here kicks in the upside of eyewitness testimony being very unreliable. Your experiences and memories are not static pieces of data. You can't file them somewhere and not look at them. You can't delete them, but you can change them. You can modify them. You can send your imagination backwards and imbue them with different meaning, change their relationship to everything else. People always cite that Psych 101 basketball gorilla counting clip. You know the thing I'm talking about? This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Did you spot the gorilla? Well, you didn't see the gorilla, you fucking dumbass! Sometimes people cite this stunt as some sort of demonstration of how frail our ability to perceive is, how easily distracted human beings can be, how unreliable we are as data collectors. But we're not data collectors. The malleability of our experiences and memories is what makes us so much more powerful than a pooter. Your phone can store a video, but you can give that memory meaning. You can transfigure the past in pursuit of a more beautiful future. Can your fucking pooter do that? This experiment doesn't tell you that your memory sucks. It tells you that you're fucking awesome at ignoring unimportant shit. And by extension, trauma interrupting our life's narrative so intensely and trapping us at that point in the past at which things cease to make sense is a sign of how highly we prioritize a cohesive story that carries us effectively into the future. The two most common reactions to trauma are you suppress it, block it, compartmentalize it, and then try to continue with your previous story while that thing kind of seeps in and kills you from the outside. Or you get trapped in that memory and you can't imagine your future anymore. You're just sitting here with this thing. You're like, guess I'll die then. Like Max from Stranger Things, which this is still a video about. You give up on the other things in your life. You accept that this experience defines you. It's okay, I'm okay, you're okay. Stranger Things. Goo Man haunts Max with images of her traumatic experiences. He validates her disconnection from the rest of reality and her isolation from her friends. He asserts that it's just and true for this discrete experience to define her. But the problem with identifying with that memory is that that identity doesn't have a future. There's nowhere to go except for to relive that moment and recreate it. In the moments leading up to the scene in question, we see Max's embodied disconnection from the future and present. Hey, what are you doing? No, don't, that's not for now. Don't open it now. Instead of envisioning or fighting for a future that includes her active existence, she doomsday plans for her absence. What is this? It's a fail safe. For after. Yeah, if things, if they, if they don't work out. This way of interfacing with the world is not exactly what John Dewey would call the experience of the creature truly alive. John Dewey wrote a lot of books. Like a lot of books, maybe too many. He has covered every topic that you can possibly imagine and this is supposed to be his treatise on aesthetics. But despite supposing to be about art, <laughs> it starts with like eight, nine chapters of just pure metaphysics before even talking about art and King. Absolute iconic behavior, no notes. Don't let them tell you to stop digging your hole. Because John Dewey believes that aesthetics are a natural integrated element of our reality and experience, first he has to define experience in its totality. So he gets into some of his other ideas about pragmatism. He believes truths are things that are good to believe because they lead to satisfactory results. For example, if I believe that I like making art and then I wake up tomorrow and I make art and then that makes me happy, then that was, that was good for me to believe. That was true that I like making art. So you can see how an important function of truths and knowing truths is to guide us towards the future. If you believed in other things and thought other things were true, you would act differently. So everybody's got this body of truths that you use to get around in this world. But experience sometimes gives you a new truth that's contradictory to your old truths. Dewey argues that in the process of learning or integrating new experiences or new truths into ourselves, our previous body of truths desires to remain as unchanged as possible because we're trying to hold on to all this value. But if you want to accept this new contradictory truth, some of your old truth is going to have to break down in a way that accommodates it. It requires continuity. Truth is not this static thing that's out there, these pieces of data that you just need to get and store. It's an ongoing process of allowing your old self to die and be reborn, incorporating that which killed it within to it, becoming ever the stronger. That's what it means to be alive, to exist in the present with your past meaningfully informing your ever unfolding future. Trauma is in the past. It is static. And that which is static, which is not a process, is that which is dead. I'm going to clap. That moment is in the future right now.
but it's coming towards us. When it happens, you're going to know it's the moment you were waiting for. For that single, clapping, resounding, present moment, you'll be there. In that moment that you're thinking of right now that's coming towards us, you're going to be in it for a second. Then it's going to launch itself into the past with your memories and with everything else. It's coming. Ready? That's fucked, isn't it? You feel it going back there? It's just the light speed just into the past. When Moses asked God what his name was, God didn't say God. He said, I am. Who are you? I am that I am. Not I was or I will be. I am. This instant I am. I am. I am. That moment of the clap, the cutting edge of reality, the ever unfolding present, that is God. You don't know anything's real except for the present. The present is all there is. That's why I call it a holy moment to sit and realize that you're here right now. And it's the only thing you know for sure. You might have imagined your past. The future hasn't happened yet. The only thing you know is real. Look at my fucking eyes for a second. Now. You're alive now. You're doing this. Now. That's all it's for sure. That's why I call that God. When you're on a journey and the end keeps getting further and further away, then you realize that the real end is the journey. It's not bad. Uh, this is it. This moment now is the heavenly moment. John Dewey described the experience of deconstructing and reconstructing your past to have continuous intentional intimate relationship with the future, the experience of the being truly alive. The mnemonic imagination describes the same process as healing from trauma. Jesus Christ of Nazareth describes life that incorporates death as life and life abundantly. Depression and trauma are about being trapped within the past and disconnected from the continuous nature of your timeline. It's about not being able to imagine a future. It's about time and narrative and identity and transfiguration fucking time is an illusion you fucking fuck layer three the metaphysical you do not actually have to have seen stranger things season four to grasp the meaning of the scene in fact abandoning the dead weight of lore and context potentially gets you even closer to the text as it presents itself in its inherent meaning without getting ensnared by five things you missed and what's in for season five see i don't really care what goo man's name is or how he became a goo man or where this hell dimension is or i don't really really require an explanation as to why the music opens up a portal in between the two worlds. If and maybe any music would work, maybe this particular song works for some particular reason, or maybe the inherent redemptive power of Kate Bush simply has the propensity to dispel demonic entities. If you just stare at the text of this scene in isolation, you get an autonomous metaphysical short film about the nature of reality and dualities, and that means that we get to shit talk Descartes for the very first time this year. So let's act like we don't know anything about Stranger Things, even if we do. There is a girl, and there is a goo man. <laughs> But very quickly, we're introduced to the idea that this is not happening in any physical place. This is inside of her mind, where her physical body is in some sort of uh, seizure-like state in the pile of grass with her friends. <laughs> the good boys are responding to the stakes by frantically rifling through a bunch of different tapes. Clearly, this is an essential component of saving their friend. And can we just appreciate the sound design of this, like, five seconds? Now! That, that clack crunch sound, delectable. <laughs> when they get the headphones on the girl and they start playing Kate Bush, you can see visually and audio auto, uh, orally, <laughs> you can experience visually and orally how this song is working as connective tissue seeping into the mind through this barrier, whatever it is. Kate Bush is echoing down from the clouds like some sort of heavenly siren anthem and there's a literal portal that opens. So all this sets up stakes and physicality, magic system, world building, good guys, bad guys, the solution and the obstacle, it's all right there. Then you get the dialogue. There's not a lot of dialogue in this scene, but if you're paying close enough attention and you're looking at this scene without trying to be like, oh, it's just a metaphor for depression, then you can see that the entire scene is anchored around the word here. You belong here. You're not really here. We're right here. I'm right here. I'm still here. I'm still here. So why is that? What, what is this? You're here. 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 
clear. I, 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 no one ever talks about this. Why is the word here repeated at these essential points of the scene? Let's look at the first appearance of the term. They can help you back. You belong here with me. With me. <laughs> Okay, so he's alleging that her friends in the physical world can't do anything to break into the mental world to save her from me, the goo man. And further, he says that that's good because she belongs here in the mental world, away from them, with me, the goo man. And the second time the word here is used is in Max's response. You're not really here. She says, you're not really here, which if you think about it, is a little bit of a strange rebuttal. She doesn't argue with the assertion that she belongs here. She lets that sit unchallenged. Instead, she contests what here is. Is. Sure, I belong here, but you're not here. Here is something else. And Goo Man has a hefty response that takes us into the climax of this scene. Oh, but I am. I am. But I am. I'm, I'm right here, how can you deny it? Putting the scene under this very direct atomic microscope like this starts to reveal an emotional and philosophical conflict between objective natural reality and subjective perceptual reality. Rene Descartes was the I think therefore I am guy, a hardcore rationalist and an embodiment of a school of thought that some people might say is fucking poison. Some people, I don't know who, but some people might say that. This is what Descartes has done, I think. His vision of the human is something that's really reduced to the mental realm. He even thinks of the person as if like it's it's uh, it, it's a cognition or if it's a mental uh, process that exists independent of the body, that exists independent of other people, that exists independent of the environment, that exists mm. independent of interaction. But that's not the case. Descartes as a character in philosophological history can be comfortably characterized and categorized as a propagator of the mind-body duality and a rationalist, like capital R. In philosophy, rationalism is often contrasted with empiricism, and this can be roughly interpreted as another analog of the mind-body split. Empiricists believe that all knowledge comes through your senses. You need to touch something or hear something or see something to learn something. In other words, all knowledge comes to you through your body. Rationalists, on the other hand, don't deny that you can gain kinds of knowledge through your senses, but they believe that the highest forms of knowledge come not from your body senses, which can be fooled, but through reason and logic, using your mind to overcome the bias of your body and your senses so you can arrive at the highest, most immutable governing truths of reality. Facts don't care about your feelings. So Descartes, as a hardcore rationalist, set himself on a mission to remove himself from perception, to doubt all of his lived experience, to doubt all of his senses, and with the cold, lonely world of pure reason and logic, deduce a single thing that he knew for sure. You know when someone boring gets high and goes like, man, what if what I see is blue is what you see as red? So Descartes was like, yeah, that, but like everything, right? Perhaps the entire universe is simply the two minute hallucination of someone that did a bong rip of salvia. But using nothing but reason, by doubting every possible sense perception that he had, Descartes did come to the conclusion that the fact that I am capable of doubting all these things means at least there is a me to be doing the doubting. I think, therefore I am, in some capacity, whether I'm a brain in a jar with nodes hooked up to it, giving electric signals to my wet machine to make me think that things are happening, or if we all live inside of a simulation and I'm just one string of ones and zeros with absolutely no free will, or if I'm in a psych ward and I only think I'm talking to a camera, or if everything is exactly how I perceive it to be. No matter what, I am. Because I think. I forgot to say that part. I, I am because I think. Um, okay, so uh, dualities show up all the time in philosophy. We cannot escape them. We are always talking about them. If you go all the way back, you're going to find your spirit and flesh duality, or at least like heaven and hell. And as you keep going on, you're going to find, you know, of course, more evil and good and the mind and the body or mind versus matter or subjectivity, objectivity, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, there's order and chaos. There's always something. There's a good reason for this. I'll explain shortly, but important to note about dualities. What a lot of anti-dualists will argue is every time you do assert a duality, you're implying almost every single time, that one of them is better or more primary than the other. When you're talking about the spirit versus the flesh, you're talking about the transcendent spirit that elevates above the flesh. Generally, when people are talking about reason versus emotion, they mean reason is the real thing and your emotions are flitting and need to be subjugated by your reason. The phrase literally goes mind over matter. Conquer your body. Don't be fooled by your feelings. Be logical. Descartes is espousing what is essentially a very old idea. You know what I like a lot more than materialistic things? 
knowledge. Descartes epitomizes this and takes it to the extreme with the hypothetical thought experiment about the evil demon, <laughs> the evil god, evil demon god. The idea is, yeah, you think you have a body and you're where you are, but what if there was an evil demon god man that was manipulating you with magic powers beyond your comprehension to convince you that you're where you are, but in reality, you were somewhere else. And at first when you think of that, you go, whoa, spooky. What if what I think is real isn't real. It's the same sinking loss of agency sensation that you get when you think about the idea that we might be in a simulation, that we're some computer replica of reality, nowhere close to the top layer of reality. Oh, we live in a snow globe, nothing's up to us. Given these upsetting hypothetical possibilities, you might be led to only trust reason. Your conscious ability to use logic, even if your senses will never reveal to you that you're in a simulation, if you think hard enough about it, you might find that's actually the transcendent truth. For senses can be fooled, but logic is impenetrable. The problem with this is it requires you to prove a negative, which is stupid. <laughs> sure, that'd be fucked up. But do you have any positive evidence that it's true? Do you have any reason you're talking about this? It doesn't make a difference, so what's the difference? Like if an evil demon was tricking you perfectly in a way you could never detect, well, the illusion is your reality and you're, you're never leaving it. So congrats, we added an extra step, but you're just alive again and you have to still try to have a good life in identical fashion to as if there weren't an evil goo demon, which you cannot prove is true. Dude, what if I and everything I know are just the dream of some alien somewhere? in a machine that his alien bros are using to induce psychedelic subconscious states, to hallucinate parallel strains of reality, to research the infinite multiverse. Anyways, I was thinking of getting Thai tonight. If there were an evil demon manipulating your senses in any way that was relevant to you, it wouldn't look like everything was normal. It would look like this. <laughs> If he can control your senses, he can control your mind. He can control your reasoning process. If it's here, it's here. The call is coming from inside the brain. And if it's not here and it makes no difference, you're just making it up. Everybody believed that because he was so smart. He was also wrong. Making him and everyone else on earth look like a bitch again. The flashback. <laughs> mind-body dichotomy philosophical exchange leads to one of the most inexplicably awesome moments in all of Stranger Things. There's this biblical visual of Max's body getting raised up in the air to be crucified for the suffering of her mind, coupled with the climax of this orchestral remix of the Kate Bush song. Something about this visual and audio experience is just aesthetically awe-inspiring. This is the peak of the tension in this scene, and the dread and hopelessness takes us on an internal transfiguration that leads Max to triumph over the odds. When you remember this scene, you tend to remember that she's about to die, then she closes her eyes and intentionally goes back into her memory in search for meaning at her moment of despair, the inspiration to go wow. When in actuality, when you go back and watch it, her first memory is not intentionally called upon. It's an intrusive memory that comes to her unbidden as she gazes away at the life she's about to leave, conceding to the higher reality of the mind. I don't want a letter. We're right here. We see one of her friends in the real world making an alternative argument for who and what is here. I'm right here. What's more real? What's more important? What's more here? Your disembodied consciousness or your body in space and time? Are you alone in the universe and fundamentally can only be certain that you exist and you are seeing the crap that you're seeing? Or can you trust that others also exist and you can be here with them? Only once Max is confronted with both of these propositions does she deliberately shut her eyes to peruse her memory searching for an answer to the question. What is here? And you can't argue with the memories because the memories subsume both parts of this duality. It's not just the hell dimension of Max's consciousness isolated from the rest of the world. It's her consciousness in the world. It's both of them. This is here. These people. These places. With you in it. Not a mind palace. Not some abstract red dimension with a goo man. Places. Others. Physical space. The memories and aspects of reality that the montage chooses to show as the music comes to a climax emphasizes this point. We punch closer and closer to the raw physicality of relation with others. A hug. A kiss the sharing of water, and finally what pushes Max over the edge into desperate desire to interface with reality is the hard impact of a high five. A fucking clap! Her hand touching another hand, which reminds her of the fact that she has hands, and she uses the hand to attack the goo man. 
She releases one of his tentacles by thinking happy thoughts and regaining the will to live, but then she uses her hand to fucking rip one of his tubes out and run back towards her body with her body. Here's the difference between duality and dialectics. In duality, you think the mind and body have some inherent separateness, and naturally, generally, you assert that one is superior over the other, and the other is like an epiphenomenon or something that must be conquered most of the time. But in understanding dualities, dialectically, you understand it's not mind versus matter. It's not rationalism versus empiricism. These two things are not separate. To understand in terms of dualism is to understand in terms of conflict and tension of two aspects of reality. To understand dialectically is to understand that these dualisms can be transcended and subsumed into one that is a more accurate picture of reality, because because the apparent contradiction between them is simply a result of our necessarily limited conceptualizations. Often you'll hear from people that have had psychedelic experiences like on shrooms or DMT or something, have a transcendent experience where they're like, holy fuck, it's all connected. It's all one pulsating being of love and understanding. I get it now. But it's impossible for those people to effectively articulate the experience to a person who hasn't experienced it. Because a word or a concept is inherently definition. It's, it's difference, it's cutting things off from the pure oneness. It limits it in some capacity so that it can be articulated. Language and concepts are essentially about definition and difference. Specificity and exclusion for the sake of pointing at one particular bit of reality instead of all of reality, which would be useless. It's the difference between me saying ducks have the little flappers on their feet and saying everything. You know, everything contains that the ducks have the little flappers, but it's not helpful. <laughs> we make a word for bear that's different than tree, so that when I say bear, you don't think trees, forest, the cycle of life, and then get your head bitten off by a bear. Okay, so like the point is, reality comes as this undivided whole. Then for practical reasons, we differentiate it into concepts so we can deal with it. And the minimum unit of difference you can slice through a singular totality is one line, one difference. Duality. So in a way, duality is all you got. That's why you got dualities and all sorts of religions and philosophies throughout all of history. It's the first thing you could do. As you break reality into a duality and then start splitting it into smaller and smaller parts, you get to taste and touch the universe more. It's very useful. And when you dialectically build it back up into a totality, you're getting closer to something like God, but less actionable than any part on its own. So no, Descartes, truth is not exclusively within your mind. What do you, you think your mind isn't in your brain? Do you think your mind is different than your brain, Descartes? It's one fucking thing. Believing that the truth can be found only through pure rationalism without any empiricism, or trying to separate subjectivity and objectivity, results in what Russian philosopher Vladimir Solovyov described as a thought without a thinker and without anything to think of. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't conceptualize dialectics exactly how Hegel conceptualizes dialectics, but Hegel does say the true is the whole. This is the spiritual revelation that takes place within this scene, beneath the action, beneath the metaphor. When the goo man says, You belong here. He's right. When he says, They can't help you, Max. He's wrong. When Max says, You're not really here. She's half right. When Caleb says, We're right here. I'm right here. He's 100%. The final mention of here is in the very last line of the short film. As Max has reunified her mind and body and touches the people that make her her. <laughs> I thought we lost you. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. If you're watching this, whatever you've experienced, whatever separation you feel, you're still here. You belong here, and it's good to be here. But is that what the Stranger Things scene is about, or am I just making all this up? Layer zero, over-interpretation? Is interpretation bad, actually? Interesting proposition, I hope not, because we just did a lot of it. What, what, I can't drink fucking orange juice? Sometimes I like a nice glass of neat mix. Susan Sontag was an American writer, philosopher, and political activist, thank you Wikipedia, who wrote a classic essay on aesthetics called Against Interpretation. And this essay indicates that she maybe would have disliked what I've done here. Sontag condemns a tendency in modern art critique to explain away the value of art by separating its form from its content. It's not just a scene where Max runs away from a monster, it's a metaphor for depression. Star Wars isn't just an action movie in space, 
face with lasers, it perfectly follows the monomyth. The monomyth. The monomyth. It's like an appeal to authority to justify the art. Like the art is only valuable because of the deeper thing it represents. It's not just entertainment, it's meaningful. It says something. What the fuck you got against entertainment? <laughs> Why is it only meaningful if it says something that isn't it? This kind of interpretation is always trying to dig underneath the immediate sensuous experience of the thing to find like the, you, the that it actually maps onto an idea that your favorite white guy had. Pick your favorite literary interpretive white guy. Sontag singles out critics who analyze art using a Marxist or a Freudian lens, digging underneath the appearance to the secret meaning, revealing that it's really about class struggle or fucking your dad. What kind of basic bitch would do something annoying like that? But moving away from this academic intellectualization of art, I feel like we could abstract extract this principle and apply it to our internet culture of review and analysis as well. Five things you missed in Andor about Dorp Porbo. Bambi ending explained. Don't hug me, I'm scared. Decoded. The hidden lore of don't hug me, I'm scared. Don't hug me, I'm scared. Unmasked. Decrypting the wakey wakey trailer. Don't hug me, I'm scared. We were wrong about don't hug me, I'm scared. Don't hug me, I'm scared. Explained in Gumball? Explained in Gumball. It's secretly about religion, or it's secretly about authoritarianism, or it's secretly about the media. What these two kinds of interpretation have in common is you're assuming that the thing that you're actually looking at that's here isn't it. Okay, that's fine, but I don't think that's it. You're trying to figure out what it's secretly about, actually. The referencing away from art as it exists in the medium to this external authority to explain its meaning can also be found in other things, like adaptation or insecurity about a medium. Professor C.T. Nguyen is a games writer, an aesthetic and ethical philosopher, a former food critic, and friend of the channel. I want to get oh. through some of these questions since I don't want to um, take too much of your time, although uh, I value speaking to you very much. I want to open with an easy one. Um, what is art and prove it? <laughs> he writes in his book, Games, Agency as Art, which we are currently reading in book club on the Patreon page, that often, out of an insecurity about their perceived silliness, we try to justify the artistic value of games by their apparent similarities to other, more respected art mediums. When you're trying to prove the artistic seriousness of video games, you don't delve into the dynamic experience of playing Fortnite. You retreat to pointing at The Last of Us and how cinematic it is. The seriousness and importance of fiction and social critique are well established. If we can show that games can and do function as a form of fiction, cinema, or modern art, then the status of games as art, and thus their cultural worth, can be secured. See, this one's serious. This one's like a movie. Go, look, look like a movie. Then a decade later, they adapt this very cinematic game into a television show. And fans of the game love the show because it's a perfect recreation of the game. It's like I'm there again. At which point Susan Sontag would be like, why do we keep pointing at things that are not the art to explain the art? What does the show do well as a show? What does the game do well as a game? HBO's The Last of Us is better than the game, by the way. Don't at me, I don't care. It improves on the source material. What do you want me to say? That Stranger Things season four Max scene does not have to be about metaphysical reality in order for me to have simply felt scared for her, to feel emotional. But I think I can square up against against interpretations interpretation of my strange Stranger Things interpretation. First of all, it's important to note that Sontag was responding to a particular trend in art critique in her time. And when she says interpretation bad, she doesn't mean all kinds of interpretation. One, she means one particular kind of interpretation because the word interpret can be interpreted many ways. Subjectivity means like whatever you like feel like it means, man. Sontag is against the kind of interpretation that separates the bodily form of the art from its loftier and more important meaning. To interpret is to impoverish, to deplete the world in order to set up a shadow world of meanings. It is to turn the world into this world, this world, as if there were any other. She believes, like I do, that this world of meanings and our physical world are the same world. I do not believe when I am interpreting Max's scene that I am revealing hidden secret meaning to you beneath the surface. I believe that this scene has quality and you can both immediately perceive that quality and you can unfold it and unravel it and dig deeper into it and experience that quality manifold on many levels. All this interpretation is just me digging deeper into that thing you knew at the start. I'm not even joking, like this metaphysical here thing is what struck me personally about this scene. Like the second time I watched it, I was like, ah, oh, that's what's making me emotional. It feels like that's just, in it to, to me. <laughs> Patricia Taxon is a musician and video essayist who has autism. Pause for applause. In her video essay analyzing every episode of the first season of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, she interprets the series through the highly personal lens of trauma experienced at the hands of authority figures as an autistic child, the confusion and dehumanizing experience of being held to the standards of incomprehensible esoteric rules that are impossible to follow, sincerely trying to participate in society and being punished for it, being told what to feel, being told what you're feeling, being hurt and invalidated, all in the name of this unintelligible logic and morality always just out of reach. Green is not a creative color. There was never any hope of following the thread. Understanding is impossible. And that's it. 
that that's me. I feel seen here, like intentional or not. What she doesn't do is try to figure out the lore of the goddamn spaghetti man or decide what this is saying about society. But is Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared intentionally and definitionally about autism? Well, I don't think that matters. And not because art is subjective, you tepid wispy willows. I think that Patricia is responding to a very real essence in the piece. I don't think that her interpretation is distracting from the text. I think that her highly subjective personal interpretation is enhancing and enshrining the real experiential value of the piece. I don't relate to the trauma of abusive autism specific early education, but when she connects to the essence of this art with that analog, I go, that's it. That's the feeling of don't hug me, I'm scared. She's taking its wordless, sensuous essence and embodying it in language, moving us beyond just intuitively knowing the feeling or justifying the feeling by putting it on the back of a separate analysis, but fusing intuition and analysis to develop a relationship with it so we can commune around it with each other. It is powerful to speak the truth. The word becomes flesh. <laughs> no, the flesh becomes word. I go intuition, then analysis, essence, then interpretation, yin, then yang, then back again. To experience art and know it is good, but it's not enough for us. We want more. We want to connect to it with multiple pathways. We want to develop the relationship with it and be with it. This is something I think Sontag is completely okay with, but referentially is more like Alan Goldman's conception of interpretation. The idea is interpretation is a tool to maximize artistic value. The role of art critique and interpretation is in some sense to add value to the art. The art articulates through its medium some sort of essence. It gives us some sort of feeling and we reach back towards it with language and concept. Concepts. Perhaps more accurately than adding value, it's more like honoring value. Touching it, and rolling it between your fingers, tasting it, being subsumed into it, and subsuming it into ourselves, and becoming one experience of pure quality because it is good to do so. To quote the conclusion of Against Interpretation, in place of a hermeneutics, we need an erotics of art. And this is how you ought to be using the hero's journey. That's how it was extracted. Not as the thing that you do to be good, but it, it, recognizing what good tends to be. It is an analysis applied after intuition blossomed quality in an emergent pattern, but it's value first. So you start with the scene and the simple feeling of, I hope the goo man don't get her. Yeah, she got away. And why do we care if the goo man gets her? Well, the film language is telling a story as old as time. It's hopelessness and despair and fear and then perseverance and a reservoir of strength pushing through it because life is worth fighting for. And interwoven into this, I know who Sadie Sink is. I care who Sadie Sink is. I know the character Max. I know Stranger Things. I have memories with Stranger Things. Then they use this to enhance that initial feeling. Then they take this tense monster movie and align it with the grooves of depression and isolation and trauma that all of us are familiar with at some point in our lives. And what is a life? What does it mean to be alive? What's this thing that is worth fighting for? Whether you arrive at the answer analytically through my metaphysics or you arrive at it intuitively with the feeling and just what they did with the flashback scene, the answer is the world, the world we live in. This world, not some ethereal realm, this world, the heaven on earth you get to experience now. I like the idea that Eden was not, Eden will be. Eden is. Plato's split between earthly matter and heavenly forms, or the Cartesian split between the subjective body and the objective mind, these can be useful. It's how we interface with reality, which is a good thing, but they are not totality, and they sometimes can limit our metaphysical understanding of what reality is by demarcating reality into these dichotomies, obscuring the fact that the true is the whole. Form and content interpenetrate each other the same way rationalism and empiricism do, or your mind and your body, or the organism and the environment. That's why when you're truly present, when you're enlightened or in flow state, you don't notice the difference between you, the being, and the activity you're doing, or the others that it's happening with. You are truly in line with God, and there ceases to be a person in a place experiencing something. There is only the experience and quality itself. The identity of you isn't primary. It's something you deduce from the experience. Interpretations develop and deepen relationship. They flesh it out. They let us secure quality and keep it around for a while, lock it down and share it with others, develop our relationship with it, solidify that. And then later, we can update our interpretations in pursuit of higher and higher quality. I interpret art and reality and quality because it's real and I care.
I want to have a relationship with it. And I want everyone to. I want people to be getting closer to it. So I don't like concepts that I feel take them farther away than they could be. It being reality, the Tao, miraculous tales of Ladybug Cat Noir. Whoever controls both these jewels at the same time will achieve absolute power. So that's what I thought of that scene. Hope you enjoyed being here today. Remember to triumph over your goo man, whatever you interpret him to be. The world is a beautiful place and you're still here. So watch for miracles and watch miraculous. Jesus loves you and hates the institution. <laughs> Jesus loves you. Try to build a little bit of heaven on earth today. God is in you and around you and always available to access. Who says a man can't rise from the dead? I mean, stranger things have happened. Oh! I think I'm an addict, want the world and I'm a habit. I'm so fucking dramatic, got all my bones up in the attic and I dance them all around like a marionette. <laughs> Bitch, I'm back up my coma. <laughs> the fake blood permanently dyed my hair. Tune in next week for the Bleach Bath live stream. You will receive at least seven certified banger videos this year. There will also be other things this year. My life as an anonymous person will be over this year. But in the meantime, I have also amassed quite the catalog on Patreon, so I thought I would let you know what is there in case you want it and have $3. Firstly, I have an interview slash podcast the ass show called Conversations with CJ the X, where I just have conversations with interesting people and you can uh, you can watch them. So far, it's mostly YouTubers and professors. <laughs> I have a conversation with Defunct Land where we argue about art. I have a conversation conversation with Jacob Geller. We talk about religion and art. I have a conversation with uh, Sarah Zed. We talk about Twitter. You used to tweet a lot. Now you tweet less. Explain. <laughs> yes. Uh, Twitter is bad. There's a conversation with Adam Neely about taste and art. And there's a conversation with C.T. Nguyen about aesthetic philosophy. There's a conversation with Abebe Barhane about AI ethics. There's a conversation about uh, uh, pragmatism and politics and democracy with uh, Professor Robert M. Talese. Robert B. Talese? It's Robert B. Talese. Robert M. It's a different guy. There's also some conversations with some smaller YouTubers that I wish great success like Color Mind and Dainty Funk and Dr. Fatima. And I also spoke to Mia Cole. In addition to conversations with, I have a different show that's also an interviewee slash podcasty ass thing where instead of talking to people that I know, I talk to you. It's called Social No Para. And basically how it works is all my patrons have the option to DM me a Social No Para pitch, just like a little bit about yourself and something you want to talk about. And in my free time, I uh, sift through them and I pick some and we just, I send you a Zoom link, we just talk. I do a lot of these and then some of them I release as episodes for public consumption. You know how you're not supposed to trust the Fae? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. It's so funny you say that. I actually weirdly actually believe in minor deities as well, like lesser gods beneath the true God or whatever. And then, I, you know, I, I worship a lesser God. I like. <laughs> I really enjoy these conversations. This has been a very rewarding experience for me. I actually do care about people. I just don't think that Twitter users are people. You know what I'm saying? This is a much better way to connect to the people that is, or that know what the, the things that I'm doing. We talk about art. We talk about God. We talk about big tech. Also on Patreon, I post my poetry and my moody, prosaic journal entries. People seem to like those. And finally, we also run a book club. We're on our third book right now, covering games, agency, as art, that C.T. Nguyen book that I cited earlier in the video. But uh, I was thinking about doing braiding sweetgrass now. Next. Seems on brand. Or maybe we'll take a hard left turn and just read like Aragon or Artemis Fowl. So those things are available on Patreon for your access if you so desire and have $3. It's the same shit for every tier, so you just pick based off of your enthusiasm and capability. This video was not brought to you by Patreon, it was brought to you by me, but uh, <laughs> I wanna give a rare sincere thank you to the patrons for sustaining me and allowing me to do all the research and work that I want to do behind the scenes and allowing all of those sponsorship emails to continue to just pile up in my inbox. And finally, I wanna give a public expression of love and gratitude to my research team. Say hi to the research team. Say hi to YouTube quick. Hi, hi YouTube. Hi. <laughs> Instead of us saying hi YouTube, let's just say like unsubscribe. <laughs> you guys have been amazing. I'm used to thinking that I can't trust every, anyone and uh, it's all on me if I want things to be good. So um, it has been uh, a sur surreal experience to realize I can rely on some people. Um, thank you. Okay, that's it. I hear that YouTube's demonetizing people who say the F word too much, so I'm in danger.